Hello, my name is TJ Masters, and today I'm going to show you how to do the scheduled maintenance on this 1980 Honda CB750 F model. This is the Series 2 dual overhead cam version of this engine, but a lot of what we're going to cover today applies to other models and maybe even other manufacturers of vintage era Japanese bikes. So if you're trying to skip ahead, here's what we're covering. Valve clearances, cam chain, timing, car synchronization, we'll do an oil change, and finally we'll inspect and clean the drive chain and adjust the slack if need be. So what is scheduled maintenance? Scheduled maintenance is a series of adjustments that need to be performed at a regular interval as specified by the manufacturer of your bike. In this case, Honda wants us to make these adjustments every 4,000 miles, but every bike is different. I have an old 350 in the corner there that needs to have this done every 1,000 miles and your bike may be different. So make sure you have a copy of your factory service manual. I'm not talking about the Hanes or a climber manual. I'm talking about the FSM, which can usually be found in PDF form online or on forums uh, dedicated to your specific model of bike. And somewhere in the front of that manual, it's gonna tell you how to do these exact same adjustments for your bike, and it's gonna give you the interval at which they need to be performed. Uh, can you take your bike to a shop and have a mechanic do this? Of course you can. But in this case, you might be looking around for somebody who specializes in vintage bikes, in Japanese bikes, in your neck of the woods. And don't be surprised if when you take it in, you get a quote for something like $500 or $700. I see people posting online about these quotes. Uh, and that's a reasonable quote for the amount of labor involved. This is something that's gonna take us four or five hours today. But I'm gonna show you how to do it I'm going to show you what tools you need to do it, and you can spend a fraction of that amount on the right tools and gaining the right knowledge, because this is something that you're going to have to do over and over again if you want to keep and maintain your bike. So this bike only has 500 miles on it, but I rebuilt the entire motor, I've been breaking in the engine, and we're going to do the break-in maintenance, which is the same thing as the routine maintenance, and then uh, we'll set the clock for every 4,000 miles after that. The bike has been running really great. I'm really happy with it. It's consistent. It starts the same way every time. I've taken it on 80 or 90 mile stretches with absolutely no change in behavior or performance. So I'm not looking, uh, I'm not expecting rather to have to change a whole lot of what's already adjusted here, but we're going to go through, do our due diligence, uh, pay attention, and take care of uh, our machines that we care about. The other thing that I'm going to do today is I've got plans to go on a motorcycle trip and do some camping. And a friend of mine asked me the other day, uh, what tools are you planning on bringing? And I've thought a lot about this. And I thought that a really great way to find out what tools I need to bring would be to do this routine maintenance. So what I've done is I've cleaned up my workbench area, put all my tools away in the toolbox, and every time something comes out of that toolbox, every socket, every pick, every pair of pliers, it's going to get set aside. And at the end of the day, I'm going to have this pile of tools, and that's what's going to go into my tool roll. And what I'm hoping is that when I see this pile of tools, it's also going to jog my memory for anything else that I might need, I might be missing. Uh, and then that's what I'm going to take along with me. So let's get started. We're going to start from the top of the motor and work our way down, and then work our way toward the back through the drivetrain. Um, but first, we've got to get this valve cover off. And the way that's done on this bike is pop the side covers off, Take the seat off, there's a bolt on either side of the seat. Take the gas tank off. Make sure when you're taking your gas tank off that you remember to undo your fuel line. Let's get started.
So we've got the valve cover and it's rubber gasket here on the bench. And before I do anything else on this job, and this is a good habit just to get into in general, I'm just gonna clean all this off. I'm gonna clean any oil and grit that's in this groove where the gasket sits. On this particular model, there are eight spots along the gasket where the manufacturer recommends that you use an RTV or silicone gasket sealant. And you can see that on here. I'm gonna go ahead and just get that all scraped off do the same thing on the cylinder head itself, clean that up, and that's just gonna make it easier to put it back together uh, when we get to that point in the process. So let's talk a little bit about what we're looking at here before we dive into making any adjustments. Because if this is your first time opening up the engine, there's a lot to see, it can be confusing, and plus the more you understand about how this works, the better prepared you are to take care of the bike and to troubleshoot if anything should happen down the line. So here's what's going on. These two rods running in parallel are called the cams. The cams are connected to the crankshaft, which also runs in parallel at the bottom of the bike, by the conveniently named cam chain. This is also called a timing chain, or on a car, a timing belt. This timing chain runs top to bottom, so that when the crankshaft is spinning, it's pushing the pistons up and down, but it's also spinning this cam. This cam is connected with a chain over to this cam so that they're both spinning at the same time. And the reason that it's so important to get all of these adjustments correct is that the motor is not going to work unless they are. It's either going to run really poorly, if this is off by one tooth, it's going to run really poorly or it's not going to run at all because the conditions inside for ignition are not correct. So. It's the responsibility of the cams to open and close the valves. The valves are what let in air and gasoline and let out exhaust. And basically what's happening as these, as these cams are spinning, they have lobes on them. And there's a lobe on this bike on each valve. And if you're working on an older bike, you might be looking at tappets. This bike, the valve adjustment is made with shims. But as these cams spin, the lobes spin down and the extended part pushes down on the top of the valve there and opens and closes the valve. And so when we talk about adjusting valve clearance, we're talking about adjusting the space between this lobe and this valve when the lobe is not touching it. There needs to be a certain amount of space between the shim on top of the valve here and the lobe. And you change that clearance by pulling the shim out and putting in a smaller or a larger shim. Now this is important because if the clearance is too close, it's too tight, the valve is going to be opening and closing sooner than it's supposed to. And if you're looking at that uh, on the exhaust side of things, you might be exposing the seat of your valve to hot exhaust gas, which can actually scorch the valve and prevent it from sealing fully. And that's going to make your motor run like garbage. And the same thing is going to happen if your clearances are too loose and the valves are not opening wide enough. Uh, they're not opening enough to let the proper amount of air and gasoline in or they're not opening enough on this side to let all of the exhaust out. We're going to need feeler gauges. We're going to need a shim removal tool, which I'm going to show you how to use because I haven't seen a lot of stuff online uh, using the shim removal tool. And we're basically going to turn the engine with our 17 millimeter wrench, always forward, never backward, in this case clockwise, to position the cams such that we can get our feeler gauge in at the right spot and measure the clearance. The other thing I'm going to do while I'm in here is just pay attention to what's going on. These parts, there's one for each valve, there's 16 valves on this bike, and these parts are constantly touching and rubbing, and so you want to take a look and just make sure they're not damaged or pitted or scarred or scraped. This should be smooth, clean metal. And if you do notice that something is off, it might be an indication that the valves were improperly adjusted or that your cam is wearing out somehow. Paying attention oftentimes will get you more than halfway there. And that's true of almost anything in life as well as motorcycling. So when we go through these adjustments, what we're trying to do is pay attention how does the motor look? Does it look more or less what it looked like the last time we had this open? 
Is there anything different about it? Are there any metal shavings in these oil baths here? There's these, uh, these lobes are sitting in pools of oil, which is why you're going to want to do this on your center stand and not on the kickstand. So we're just going to be looking out for that kind of stuff as we go on. All right, let's do it. Okay, so we're looking at the number four cylinder on the bike, intake side, and I've got the engine rotated using my wrench on the crankshaft such that the cam lobes are pointing up and away from the valves, almost at the same angle that the valves run down into the engine. Okay, one of the cool things about working on vintage bikes is that they've had a lot of time for people to figure out what works and what doesn't work. And with this bike in particular, uh, the valve clearances that are in the factory service manual have actually been found by mechanics and enthusiasts to be too tight. And so valves get burnt out a little bit uh, prematurely. And so what they recommend for these uh, DOHC Honda bikes is not uh, what the factory service manual says, but five thousandths of an inch all around, intake and exhaust. And that actually makes it really easy when you're just looking for the same uh, adjustment on each one. So I've got my five thousandths of an inch feeler gauge in there. And if you've never used a feeler gauge before, it can take a little bit of getting used to. You really do have to feel the friction, but the fact that the five thousandths feeler gauge goes in at all means that there's at least that much space, okay? And one of the things that I like to do to double check when I'm using feeler gauges is let's just bump it up to, let's grab the seven thousandths of an inch gauge and see if we can get that in there. So even pushing on that pretty hard, that does not want to go in there. So I know that it's at least five thousandths, but it's not seven thousandths. It's probably somewhere in the middle. And if you're going to err on this uh, procedure, you want to err on the side of looseness because the valves are going to tighten up over time. As the seats naturally wear, you picture the valve running this way with like a toilet plunger on the end of it. And the top of that plunger is what seals against the cylinder head. There's a spring in here that is pulling the valve out and sealing it against that cylinder head. And so the top of that plunger is what's gonna wear, which is over time going to actually reduce this space. And so if you're gonna err, err on the side of looseness, go for, for five thousandths, six thousandths, but uh, the fact that the point zero zero seven does not slide in there, that's a great sign. So. I'm gonna go ahead and do the same thing for this uh, valve while the motor's in the same position. And then I'm gonna rotate through and get everything, putting the cam lobes, again, kind of at an opposite angle to the valve itself, pointing away and just measuring the space. So I'm on the left side of the bike and I've got a valve here on the number two cylinder that's just a little bit loose. I was able to go all the way up to eight thousandths of an inch before the feeler gauge stopped. So what that means is it's probably like a loose six thousandths, tight seven thousandths. Um, but in any case, I'm going to see if I have a shim here that is going to close that gap a little bit. So this is the Motion Pro shim tool. Uh, I think they cost like 15 bucks online. And uh, I, I do read some reviews of these uh, people having broken them. And it doesn't surprise me because it's not you know, forged steel or whatever. But if you use this properly, I don't think it's likely to break on you. So basically what's going on is there's a ridge here in the middle of it. And that ridge is going to fit right in between, right in between those two buckets such that either side of this shim tool will actually be able to press down on the bucket and push them down. So basically what you got to do here Sorry about the camera work here. You got to get your sh your shim tool in position wrapped around the cam and then bring it down toward you and you're going to feel resistance. It's going to be hard to push these things down cuz they've got some pretty mondo springs in there holding them tight. So it is going to be a little bit tough 
But if it's too tough, just stop. You know, don't don't uh, risk breaking your tool by trying to force something. Try to reposition it. I'm going to try to do this now with one hand while I'm holding the camera and see what happens. Okay, take three. You want to make sure this thing is really wrapped around the cam because as it turns, it's going to push down on the buckets and you need it to stay in position. And I've got it locked in there so that it's going to turn. You're going to bring it all the way down to the head here. And so what we've done is just given ourselves a little bit more space to work with and we can get a pick in there and pop that shim out. So that's what I'm gonna do next. So we pop the shim out. You can see on the bucket that little notched area. If you can't see that before you put your shim tool in, you can use a pick to spin the bucket around and get access to that little notched area right there because that's what you're going to use to get the pick in there and pop the shim out. And now the shims are magnetized, so it's going to feel like it doesn't want to come out, but you just got to kind of dig in there and pop it out. Use a pair of needle nose pliers to pull it out, and it's uh, 255. Now, I have a 265, which is a little bit thicker, uh, and so I'm going to pop that in and hope that our clearance is a little bit closer to 5 thousandths and not so close to 8 thousandths. And then I'm actually going to use that 255 to come over here because I had uh, a valve on the number one cylinder that was actually a little bit too tight. So you might find yourself shifting shims around. You might find yourself having to order shims online. These are about $4.95 a piece, which can be expensive if you need to do all 16 at once, but it's unlikely that that will be the case. You should be able to get by by swapping a few and you might have to buy you know, a handful of shims. So I'm gonna pop this in, measure it, and if it's all good, we're gonna move on from there. So as it turns out, I had a couple valves whose clearances were on the wide end of the range, and I didn't have the shims on hand to bring them down to that five thousandths of an inch sweet spot, but that's okay. What's happening when this bike is actually running is that the cams are riding on a thin film of oil that is not present in its current state. So when we measure the valve clearances like this, we're really only getting an approximation of what they're actually like inside the bike when it's in motion. That's why it's a range from four thousandths to six thousandths. The fact that my valves are a little bit on the wider side and I remember setting them like that when I put this motor together means that if they do end up wearing down, it'll bring them down perhaps into that range, into that sweet spot. The only way to find out is to run the bike and see. So when, we, when I check this for the 4,000 mile maintenance, I'll take the measurements again and see where we're at. And if they're still out of spec at that point, I might take the time to place an internet order and have some of the right shims delivered to me. But doing maintenance on your own bike is kind of this constant balancing of equations. Checking your work against what the factory service manual says, checking your work against what you can find online from people posting videos like this one or forums, posts. And then perhaps the most important part of the equation is the ride itself. Does the bike run? Maybe that's all the evidence you need. I'm gonna go ahead and button this valve cover up. The factory manual recommends, and I recommend as well, that you put a little bit of three bond or Honda bond gray gasket sealer just on these points of the gasket surface where the metal takes a sharp 90 degree turn. The rubber gasket doesn't do too great of a job of sealing that 90 degree turn. So just a dab of gasket sealer, and I like to do it on the cylinder head rather than the gasket because it makes it a little easier to get the right amount, and then they kind of serve to glue or hold the cylinder head, or sorry, the valve cover gasket in place while you're monkeying around with the valve cover. So I'm going to go ahead and do that, and then we'll give it some time to cure up before we move on. Okay, cam chain tension. We got the spark plugs hooked back up, tachometer cable is plugged back in, and valve cover is on. Just a quick note about these bolts. You don't have to torque these down very hard at all. You screw them in until they seat, and then that's about it. They've got these rubber collars on them, and that's what holds them in and what holds this gasket on. If you torque them down, you risk stripping them out, and I do have a stripped one, this one right here, which is just, you know, I get it as tight as I can get it, and then it'll keep turning if I keep going, so I have to stop 
Fortunately, it doesn't leak oil, so I'm gonna leave it alone for now, but you will strip these out if you try to torque them down. They just need to be seated. Okay, cam chain tension. We talked about the cam chains earlier. There's one running from the crankshaft to the cams. There's one running from cam to cam, and both of them have rubber tensioners that push against the chain while it's turning and keep it from flopping around. So this next part of the process involves that the bike be turned on. So I've got my fuel tank positioned a little bit higher, as high as I can get it, uh, and an extra long piece of fuel line running to the carbs. Before I start the bike up though and get this motor hot, I just wanna look at what we're gonna be doing here. The motor just has to be running, okay? We're not yet concerned about getting it up to temperature or getting the idle set correctly. It just has to be running, and when it's running, we're gonna loosen this bolt here, which is gonna unlock the tensioner. The tensioner has a spring in it. The natural movement of the chain is gonna put the tensioner where it wants to be, and then we're gonna lock it down again. You might not hear anything. You're definitely not gonna see anything because this is all bolted up. So adjusting the cam, cam chain tension is quick, and there's no real way to verify it, uh, unfortunately, that I know of. So we have one. Here, this, this one runs uh, horizontally, parallel to the ground, and adjusts the tension on the middle chain. The other cam chain tensioner is running perpendicular to the ground, up and down, the same way that that cam chain is. And there's a lock nut right down in there in the middle of the cylinder section of the engine that we're just gonna loosen up, let it reseat itself, and tighten it back down. And uh, I recommend getting the motor fired up and then doing this as soon as possible because it does get really hot down in here. And you're going to have to find a way to get a wrench or a socket in there. As you can see, I've got my wrench already positioned. My socket is already positioned on the nut. The motor's still off. It's not hot yet. But as soon as I turn it on, I'm going to want to get in and out of here as quickly as possible. Same thing with the front side. I've gone ahead and already loosened up this 12 millimeter lock nut, but the bolt itself is still in there. And when the motor gets going, I'm gonna get in here, loosen the bolt, tighten it back down. You don't have to torque this thing down. You're just tightening, tightening it until it seats and then lock it back down. And we're gonna do both of those hopefully in the next 30 seconds or so here once I get this motor going without the choke. So here we go. Okay, let's talk about timing. It's not likely that you'll have to adjust the timing when you do your regular maintenance. That's one of the benefits of having an electronic ignition as opposed to a points-based ignition, which is constantly going out of spec by virtue of how the points are designed. They're constantly wearing. But in case you've never seen this before, I thought I'd give you a look at, at how you time uh, the CB750. So what we're looking at here, this is the left side of the engine. We've got two pulsers. The pulsers have an, a, a metal contact point, I know it's hard to see, on the inside. And as this shaft rotates, it is also oblong, like the cams, and it's got a little nub on there that passes this contact point and fires an electronic signal, an electric signal, to your spark igniters to ignite the uh, spark plugs. So you've got one for your one and four cylinder and one for your two and three cylinder. And these pulsers can be moved around. If you're having trouble with ignition, make sure that the gap between the metal plate here and the nub that is on the crankshaft is within spec. I think point one two is recommended. Uh, the factory manual might have that a little wider, but uh, 
the forums guys uh, tell us that it should be a little closer. Um, one important thing, don't ever try to turn the motor with a wrench using this side. If you need to turn the motor, you need to go back over to the other side where the alternator is. The reason is, if you're turning on the alternator side, you're turning clockwise, and so you're tightening the alternator bolt as you turn. If you're trying to turn the motor from this side, you're going to be turning anti-clockwise, and what that's going to do is loosen this uh, holding. This this is a, um, a 10 millimeter bolt and then a little like holding uh, nut that is keeping this entire advance unit and, and ignition unit together. So that's my uh, maybe overly complicated explanation of the ignition going on here. But what I'm going to do is show you what it's like to time the engine. You need to get yourself a good uh, dynamic timing light. I mean, they cost like 50 or 60 bucks, um, but this thing is almost never going to break. I got this one from my dad. Who knows when Sears was last selling a timing light. But in any case, it's got two leads that connect to the battery. We've got our one lead that connects to the uh, spark plug wire for the number one cylinder. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to fire up the bike and we're going to point the timing light into this little window right here. And you see this uh, kind of nub sticking out there? That's our indicator mark. And when we pull the trigger on this timing light, it's gonna strobe at the same rate that signal is passing through this spark plug cable. So we're gonna see exactly when cylinder one is firing, and there's a hash mark that we're gonna be able to see through this window that is gonna show us if the cylinder is firing a little too early, a little too late, or right on time. So I'm going to start the bike up, and the next shot you're going to see uh, the timing light flashing there. I know it's a little bit hard to see at the camera, but we were looking. I was looking at those two hash marks next to the F. The F stands for firing, and we want our little indicator to be right in between those two hash marks, and it was actually closer to the right hash mark, which means it's firing a little bit later than I want it to. So you'll find that if you do have to adjust this, it's going to vastly change the quality of your idle. When, you're, when you have it dead on, the idle is gonna be purring like a cat, and anywhere off of that is gonna be a little bit rougher. You might have even be able, been able to hear in the video the, the kind of roughness there. Now, it's important that we have our idle speed set properly at 1000 RPM plus or minus 100 because the RPM speed is also going to determine uh, the mechanical advancer's position. So you wanna make sure you're idling at the correct speed when you're looking at that first indicator mark. So to change the timing, I'm gonna loosen these two bolts and that's gonna allow me to just rotate the plate. And you can kind of see if I rotate it anti-clockwise, the little nub that's on this shaft is going to hit the uh, firing point a little bit later. So that would, that would slow it down even more. If I rotate it clockwise, this nub, which is going this direction again, is gonna hit that sooner. And that's what I wanna have happen. I want it to be firing just slightly sooner than it is. Okay, so as you could see in the second shot, the strobe was flashing a little bit more in between those two hash lines, not so, not so far toward the right, and the idle's a little bit smoother. So, next thing we're gonna do is synchronize the vacuum draw coming from the carbs, and in order to do that, the engine needs to be at operating temperature. So, I'm gonna put a fan on it. I got the garage door open, and I'm just gonna turn the bike on. Since I had the gas tank off, you, know, you could ride up and down the street for 10 minutes and then do this, but since I have the tank and the seat off, I'm just gonna turn the bike on, Put the fan on it to simulate some airflow and let it idle for a little bit and then we'll do the carb sink. Rather than try to do this over the sound of the motor, I'm just going to show you what I got going on here, explain to you how I'm going to do it, and then I'm just going to do it off camera. But in order to synchronize the vacuum on your carbs, you need two special tools. The first is a carb synchronizer. Motion Pro makes these. You can find Chinese or Taiwanese off-brand versions of these on eBay. I got this one on VintageCB750.com because I was buying some other parts at the time. I think it was made in Taiwan. Uh, it cost me 60 bucks. Um, the other thing you're going to need 
is a carb sink tool. This is like a combination of a flathead screwdriver and an eight millimeter nut driver. See how the handle rotates the screwdriver in there. And that is basically for getting down on that sink screw, which there are three of them, they're between each carb, and you can unlock the nut with one half of the tool and adjust the set screw with the other half of the tool. Um, there's really no way to do this without this tool. And this one costs about 15 bucks. The important thing to remember when you're buying special tools to use for your projects like this, there's a reason you don't see a lot of these on the used market. It's because the people who own bikes are using them. And if one day you decide to get rid of all your bikes, uh, you can pretty much sell the tool for what you paid for it, provided you take good care of it. So here's how this is gonna work. I will fire up the bike while I'm recording to show you how the gauges read. Uh, this one is, this one looks like it is stuck. Got these little plastic valves on them that are kind of finicky. So right now they're all at zero. When I turn the motor on, the vacuum is gonna suck the dial down. And I'm pointing at the number two dial specifically because the number two carburetor is our base point. That one isn't really adjustable except via the idle adjuster underneath the carbs. So what we're gonna try to do is to get each one of these to match what the number two is looking like, okay? And that way we'll know that, they're, that all four of them are drawing an equal strength vacuum. And we're gonna do this in a specific order. First, we're gonna match one and two. That's easy enough. They've got their own set screw right there in between there. Then we're gonna match three and four. Doesn't matter where they're at. We're just gonna make sure that these are even because they've got their own set screw right here. Then we're gonna bring three and four in line with two because since the three and the four carburetor are linked, when we go to adjust the number two carburetor through here, it's gonna pull both of them at the same time. That's why we're gonna try to get these two even before we adjust them at all. So I'm gonna fire up the bike, you're gonna watch the gauges, and you're gonna see they're a little bit out of spec, but we're gonna bring them back even. So here's what it looks like right now. adjustment and look th these are not rocket science grade gauges they're never going to be exact but what we're trying to do is get in a ballpark for each cylinder okay and we're trying to be uh, you know plus or minus two hash marks away I guess this is me measuring uh, pounds of pressure foot pounds of pressure um, so I'm gonna fire up the bike again and show you where I'm at I'm happy with where I'm at not, you know they're not exactly on all the way across the board but they're within spec so here's what we're looking like now one more thing that i wanted to mention about the carb vacuum gauges when you're using gauges like that make sure you're not touching the throttle at all because the second you pull open that throttle it's going to open the vacuum wide open and you might risk damaging your gauges. So when you're working on the vacuum sink, you're not playing with the throttle. You're setting the idle at 1000 where it's supposed to be, and then you're working from carb to carb and trying to match up those arrows. So we're making good progress. Uh, the motor is now pretty warmed up. The oil inside is probably a little thinner than it normally is. So what I'm gonna do is bust open the oil drain plug. That's the plug on the very bottom of the bike. Uh, let the oil, the old oil drain out um, have myself some lunch while that's while that's going on. The bike is drained of the old oil. I've got the oil bolt put back in the bottom of the engine pan. Make sure you do that before you put any new oil in. But let's talk about motor oil for a second. These old bikes need plain Jane motor oil. No synthetic, no high mileage, friction modifiers, none of this marketing nonsense. Motor oil is what goes in these bikes. And the reason is they have a wet clutch, which means the clutch is submerged in oil. So if you put a synthetic high mileage, <clears throat> fancy schmancy oil in there, 
it's going to cause your clutch to stop working. It's going to be slipping or it's not going to engage at all and you're not going to have any power. You're not, you're not going to have any way to engage the transmission of the bike with the power train of the bike. So we're looking at just plain old motor oil. Now, I live in Texas and in Texas it's hot for like nine months out of the year. It's unbearably hot here. So I think the factory service manual on these bikes recommends uh, 10W40 or 10W30. In Texas, we go with 20W50. Now, let me explain this. These are friction coefficients. In a hot climate like mine, straight up motor oil. I like the Castrol GTX because it's easy to tell what's in this jug. I don't have to, uh, I don't have to parse any marketing language on the front, motor oil. So it's handy to keep an empty one of these around because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pour the used oil into this and see how far up it goes and that's how I'm gonna know how much new oil to put in the bike. Of course, once we run the bike and cycle the oil through, we're gonna check it with the dipstick. That's our due diligence. But this is a great way to get started knowing how much to put in. Put the new oil in, turn on the bike, let it cycle through, and then you take your dipstick reading. I'm not gonna show you how to do that because that's pretty straightforward. I was actually low on oil, meaning I'm putting more new oil in than what old oil came out. And that squares with what I've been doing on this bike, breaking it in, getting used to it. I had a couple of leaks uh, in the first couple weeks that needed addressing that I never really topped the oil off. So none of this information is surprising. And there's a lesson to be learned in that. You should always be comparing the information that your bike is giving you with the information that you already have on hand. It's kind of like working out a theorem, a theorem of motorcycling. And everything you do is evidence that either supports or rejects that theorem. But the more of it that you do, the stronger that the theorem gets. And if you're new to this over time, I promise you'll develop a sense of what that feels like to receive new feedback, new information from your bike, and kind of compare that to the picture that you've already built. So all that is to say, needed a little extra oil, no big deal. The other thing you should make sure you do when you're changing the oil is pop off your oil filter there and put a new one in. Now this one only has 500 miles on it, like I said, so I'm not gonna mess with the oil filter. I didn't see anything in the old oil that would give me pause. Again, we're talking about feedback, information. I didn't see any slivers of metal. I didn't see any dirt. All I saw was old looking oil, just plain old oil. So before I put the uh, tank back on and put it all back together, before I adjust the drive chain, which is gonna be the last uh, maintenance procedure that we work on today, I'm gonna go ahead and push the bike outside and just wash it off, give it a good rinse. Uh, I've got some solvent, some brake cleaner to really get the gritty stuff, but Otherwise, soap and water is good. Remember that a clean car, a clean vehicle runs better. And I'm being slightly facetious when I say that, but what I really mean is if your bike is clean, you have a better picture of it, a better image of it. You're better able to see if anything is leaking or running or staining. Keep your bikes clean, folks. All right, so we got the bike cleaned off, dried off, pushed back in the garage. I'm still working on getting the oil level just right. I think I've got the right amount in there now. And there's one more thing I wanted to talk about during this routine maintenance. And this is something that should be done uh, more frequently than every 4,000 miles or whatever the scheduled maintenance is. And I'm talking about drive chain slack. That's the slack, the amount of slack that's in your chain here. It's really more like every 300 miles, you should clean this chain off and check the slack. Because if the chain, gets too loose and it comes off the bike while you're riding there's no telling what could happen you could destroy the entire engine if the chain goes in that direction or it could destroy you if it decides to fly somewhere else so the reason i wanted to address it in this video though is because when i went to check the chain slack for this particular bike i found that when i set the slack with the bike on its center stand and i did it kind of conservatively meaning i stayed toward the lower end of the range uh, when I put the bike down and sat on it, the chain was completely tight. And I couldn't find a lot of information about this online. I watched a couple of different YouTube videos uh, from a couple of different expert seeming people. Uh, there were discussions in the comments about it. Um, some people saying it doesn't matter, do it on the side stand, do it on the center stand. Uh, obviously it does matter because 
Uh, you do not want to be riding the bike with the chain whip tight. That's a recipe for disaster, for wearing out your chain and your sprockets. So here's what I ended up with. Uh, I realized that if I set the, set the slack toward the upper end of the range while the bike was on its center stand, when the bike had a little bit of weight on it and it was on the side stand, it was squarely in the middle of that range. And then I had a friend of mine sit on the bike, no stand, while I measured the slack and managed to get it at the very lower end of that range, which on this bike is 15 millimeters. We're looking for 15 to 25 millimeters slack. And so right now the slack is about 25 millimeters as it measures here. But in any case, if you're setting your chain slack, which you should be doing every 300 miles, you should also be cleaning the chain with kerosene or some kind of degreaser and re-oiling it. Um, you need to be aware that it's going to be different depending on how much weight is on the bike because the pivot of the swing arm is going to put tension on the chain. And you just want to make sure that when you're sitting on the bike or whoever is normally riding this motorcycle, when they're sitting on it, that the chain slack has uh, enough as specified by the manufacturer. So if you don't know how to adjust your chain, uh, it's the same for most bikes. Um, there are two, back up here. There are two uh, adjusters here that you'll need to unlock, one on each side of the swing arm, and then you'll want to loosen your actual axle. And then by turning in these adjusters, you can uh, increase or decrease the slack. And what you want to make sure is that when you're all finished, you're either using the scale that is printed on the swing arm on both sides, which is not always accurate, or you're taking a ruler or some calipers and measuring how much of this bolt is extended and making sure that it's equal on both sides. That has to do with wheel alignment and wheel trueness. If your wheel is not straight on down the middle, the chain is not straight on down the middle, you're gonna get premature wear, you're gonna get chain noise, and at its worst, you're gonna get a catastrophic chain failure, which is bad for you, bad for the bike. So always double check that your alignment is correct by measuring the bolts or using the scale on the swing arm. Check that the slack is correct when the bike is being actually loaded by the normal amount of weight uh, that you are using. And finally, I mean, they went over this in the motorcycle class that I took a few years ago, but always check your tires. Check the pressure in your tires, check the tread, the wear on the tires, make sure they're not wearing unevenly. You only have two of these babies, and if one of them goes out, then the whole bike is done for, and you're done for as well. So. That brings me back to what we were talking about the whole time, which is just pay attention. While you're doing your routine maintenance, it's a good time to take a look at the different parts of the bike that you're not always looking at as the rider. For example, I found out that both of my passenger peg bolts were loose by the same amount, which seems very weird. Not weird that one of them would be loose, but weird that both of them would be loose by the same amount. But I wouldn't have noticed that if I weren't kind of paying attention along the way to everything that we worked on today. All right, so, hey, I hope you found what you were looking for in this video. Um, I was inspired to make it because I couldn't find a lot of visually oriented, step-by-step -step information about these Series 2 DOHC Hondas online. There's some videos out there, there's good forums posts out there, but my goal was to bring it all into one place do a kind of comprehensive overview of the scheduled maintenance and uh, provide enough information so that you actually understand what's going on and why it's important that we do this stuff regularly. I just want to stress that if you take this to a shop, you know, this, this whole job takes about three to four hours. It took me five or six because I was trying to video the whole thing and I'm not really good at that. But um, if you take this to a shop, and especially if you have to go to a specialty shop in your town, labor starts at $80 an hour and goes up from there. And so you're looking at anywhere from four to six to $800 to do maintenance that is going to come up again. And so I'll put a list of the special tools that I used down in the description, uh, ways that you can do this on the cheap, try to obtain things on the cheap or whatever. Um, the important thing to know is that if you are thinking about doing this or you wanna get into doing this and you're worried that you don't know enough the information is out there, and I promise you that you can do this work. This is very fun. It's not always easy, 
but it's fun and it's fun to learn how to do it too. So I hope I was able to help you. Um, I'm not really a YouTuber by trade, so this is not a channel or a plan, part of a planned series or anything, but if you want to support me, I'm on Twitter and Instagram. I'm planning on taking a big trip with this bike uh, soon once the veil of pandemic uh, has lifted and we're able to move around a little more safely uh, in the United States and in the world. Uh, I have plans to take this bike on a long road trip and I'm going to be documenting that as well. So find me there um, if you like or not. All right. I hope you're having a great day. Um, it's great riding weather today. I might go for a spin here after I take a little break and uh, cool off. No drinking and spinning. All right. Uh, peace.